Good morning. It is Sunday morning and it is a sunny day and the snow has not melted off. We got so much snow. Still lots of snow out there, but the roads are clear and um, just an update on the puppies. The goody litter is climbing out of their box. So we have fixed them a different pin because Rose is due, my Rosie's due, praise God, after, <clears throat> excuse me, shipping in that sperm and her having a uterine infection, I wasn't really sure she was going to be able to carry another litter. So thank you, Jesus. She is up. But she cycled again a little soon and so I didn't catch her to do a bunch of progesterone until when I caught her I did progesterone and she was ready to be bred so I had to breed her right then. So I'm just taking her temperature and Tim's sitting with her while I run do an errand. It's the first time I've been out of the house in two or three days. I think I've been out of the house twice this week. So the Goody Litter's three weeks old yesterday, the day before, and they are doing really, really good coming out of their box and learning to eat out of a bowl. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had, a, I had a biscuit this morning and the flour makes me mucusy. So, the Caboodle litter is two weeks old, and she has still kind of struggled we, uh, uh, with mastitis in her tits, but <clears throat> right now I'm just sitting in there, of course I sit in there ever feeding, but trying to help work each one of those so that they get completely milked out, and sometimes I'm feeding her litter every two hours, so I'll put her in, take her out, put her back in take her out for three hours while I go rest and then put her back in, take her out, put her back in. So trying to keep her totally nursed out, which has been quite the challenge. So she's retiring, Caboodle is retiring and she's happy about that. So they're two weeks old. So if she can just nurse them for another week, we'll try to dry her up. Both of my girls look pitiful. They've lost so much weight, but the more I feed them, the more milk they make, the more they have mastitis. Goody's tit that ruptured is all healed. It's just a little on the outside, you can see, but praise God that healed really nicely. I was using Epsom salt on it three or four times a day, and I had her on a strong antibiotic, but that's healed up, so I'm so pleased. <clears throat> the caboodle litter, every time I grab my camera to do a litter, I mean to do a video, someone poops and then it's poop everywhere, and by the time I get it cleaned up, someone else has pooped. By the time I get that cleaned up and someone else has pooped, I don't feel like doing a video and the blanket's dirty. <laughs> so, people don't understand, you know, that <clears throat> everything is not always pristine. I mean, we try to keep everything clean, but when you have someone pooping. Ooh, this was shady through here. I've still got some ice on the road, some snow and ice on the road. This is where we used to live in Goshen. I should have known that was going to be covered right there. Or patchy. working on my book, which is exciting. I was up till one o'clock last night, working dutifully, diligently working. So here I have a question for anyone, someone. My windows in the kennel part were scratched by a plastic scratch thing and <coughs> I've tried, I haven't tried uh, baking soda, but I mean, they can't be scratching worse than they are. Looks like someone took a green scratch pad after them. I did try toothpaste and that didn't do anything. So how to buff that out? And I haven't found anything online that would, 
I personally haven't found anything that would tell me how to do that or how to get that done. I had someone contact me wanting to clean my windows, which I clean them every week, so that doesn't work um, professionally, right? And he said he does not have the equipment to do it because it would be so expensive. And this is interesting. He said, if you take a razor blade and you push, you will not scratch the window. But if you pull, because you have dirt underneath it, you will scratch the window, not from the razor blade, but from the dirt underneath it. So who knew? I didn't know that. I don't know if that's true. That's what he told me. Anyway. I've never used a razor blade on my window. You don't need to. If you'll spray your windows down, let them soak for a few minutes, spray them again and wipe them, everything comes off. You don't need a scratch pad or a, anything else to scratch your windows clean. It's unnecessary. So, I know, I don't want to get worked up here, but uh, yes, I am still sad that my windows so there's a small window here that opens and then a great big picture window and then another small window over here that opens so that's one window and then on the other side of the house on the east side there's another one and yes every one of them are scratched every one two three four five six seven eight nine ten windows are scratched they're all scratched from a plastic and i anyway i just asked this person, I said, could you not see that you were scratching the windows after the first window? No. So, I guess motive is a lot, right? It's not like they intentionally scratch my windows, but I still have scratched windows. <laughs> Woo, my windshield wiper blades are frozen. Had some snow ice cream, that was good. So my books, I'm working on my book. I was in Genesis 24 yesterday, just thinking about the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And this is the story of Abraham sending a servant, which it doesn't say in Genesis 24, it was Eleazar, but that's the way I remember it. He sent his servant with ten camels and a bunch of armed men, I'm sure, to make this trek to another country, actually back to his home country. So this is what's so great about prayer, too, I could say that about Genesis 24. Abraham was praying, Isaac, was his son, was praying for the right wife, and the servant was shaking in his boots praying that he would come back with the right woman I mean this is pretty serious right <clears throat> so I love this you can uh, read it in Genesis 24 where the servant is praying and it tells you what he prays <laughs> probably had all of his men praying we don't want to make this trip for no reason so let's uh, all agree that we're going to find this person so this is kind of like a needle in a haystack right so this is interesting too because Abraham told him to go back to the place that he was actually from so when Eleazar gets to Haran, the city that Abraham was from, he said he was from Ur, but in this area, he had prayed this prayer, petition to God. He said, the young lady that I see, and I ask for a drink of water, have her offer to water my camels. So this is what this whole chapter in the book is about, is how you do anything is how you do everything. How we practice living our life, right? Every little choice. It, and this is, was, I forgot the guy's name that wrote the book Atomic Habits, but he talks about this. He, he talks about this in the chapter where he's talking about 
<clears throat> I think Britain used to be horrible bicyclers and they didn't, bicycle companies didn't even want to sell them bicycles like for the Tour de France or something, you know, I'm talking world class bicycles because they didn't want to look like failures. So he was just talking about how the British team improved these little, little things, little, little things from dust in the van, all these from sleep habits to the people that, the bicyclers, right? To different ways to exercise. Anyway, and then they went from being a losing team to a winning team, these little things. So I said that to say this, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Practice, we are practicing for the real thing, right? Which is heaven. Obviously, it's just our getting ready place. So, she, so, and I love this, it says, she was very pretty, and it says she was a virgin, which is very important. Uh, it says, Rebecca came walking to the well, or springs, it was probably a well, in the evening to to uh, collect water. So this is interesting too because when she leaves, <clears throat> it says her attendants and her nurse went with her. So it wasn't like she didn't have servants. You know, they were probably a well-to-do household and she had servants. And yet, she wasn't sitting on the couch waiting for someone to wait on her. So because she had practiced when Eliezer asked her for a drink of water, she said, she lowered her jar and she said, yes, and I will water your camels too until they have drunk their fill. Well, a camel can drink 20 to 30 gallons. I don't know that from experience. I just read that on the internet from several sources. People that would know. And there were 10 camels. It does say in the Bible there was 10 camels. So that's... How many gallons? 200 gallons? It's a lot of water to haul on your shoulders to the trough, right? Probably took her an hour or two. And she wasn't planning on doing this in her day, and yet she just had a real servant's heart. And this was very interesting, too, in the scripture where it says, Eleazar watched her the whole time she was doing this to see if she was the one. And you can learn a lot about someone when they're working, if they're complaining, if they are um, doing it with the right attitude and with a happy heart. You know, she did what she did with a happy heart. So she went from <clears throat> uh, just going to gather water for the family that evening to having a marriage proposal to a great and wealthy man's son. And so, um, Eleazar had 10 camels and it said they were loaded with good stuff. That's what the scripture says, good stuff. It was loaded with good stuff for the family of the bride. And I just love that. So Eleazar takes out a bracelet, two bracelets, and a nose ring. <laughs> I know, right? It would be like earrings to us today, I'm sure. It said, the bracelets weighed 10 shekels. That's 113 grams of gold. So I looked it up, how much that would be worth a day, about $6,500. So he gave her, and that wasn't the ring in her nose, that was her bracelets, were worth about $6,500. So she goes to water somebody's camel and she comes back with some honking jewelry. So when she goes home and tells her brother, he's all about the money, Laban's all about the money. And so he runs and invites the guy in to stay the night with them. And anyway, but it's just one chapter, but it's a beautiful chapter. and. Um, I love this because 
Eleazar and the men and the camels come and they make him a big meal and he says, I will not eat until I tell you why I've come. And then he tells the story about praying and how Rebecca walked out and offered him the water and offered, answered his prayer, offered. And so he found out that Rebecca's dad's dad was Abraham's dad's brother or something. Anyway, they were dis distantly related cousins, distant cousins. So that made it even better. That's what Abraham wanted. <clears throat> so, so, so let me tell you one more thing before I jump off here. So Laban and Rebe is Rebecca's brother and Laban's dad think, yeah, this guy's really rich. I mean, he's got these servants and all these camels weighted down with all this stuff. So they don't want him to leave. <clears throat> and he said, now that I have been successful, I'm going back to my master. I'm going to leave. So they go, no, 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 stay for 10 days. And he goes, no. And so the mother says, well, let's ask Rebecca. And so they ask her, do you want to go with these men and marry Abraham's son? And I love this. She said, I do. And I just thought that was so reminiscent of a, of a wedding ceremony, you know, when, when we are asked, do you take this woman to be your wife? And the man says, I do. And I just love that. So, and it was a, um, they go the 300 or 600, everybody has a different idea of how far that they went. I think it's probably 300 miles back to where Abraham and Isaac lived and it said Isaac was out in the fields and <clears throat> he saw the camels coming and she saw him and she said who is that and Eleazar said that's the master's son and she liked him so she puts her veil on and Isaac was looking and he's like who is that <laughs> Anyway, then the chapter ends up that they did love each other and it said Isaac was comforted after the death of his mother, Sarah. Anyway, it was a beautiful love story and it was just, um, that she proved herself to be worthy to be in the line, the genealogy of Jesus and, and actually this is the whole uh, nation, the whole tribe of, of Israel, right? She was the grandmother of, well, no, she was the mother of Jacob, who God renamed Israel. So that's pretty heavy stuff. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. So may we be careful how we do everything from our thoughts to our deeds, right? So let me pray for you. Ah, this beautiful Sunday morning, Lord, you're amazing. Your word is amazing. The wonderful things that we can learn from your word are amazing. Thank you, God. May we never hide from doing a good job. May we be delighted May our work reflect on you and have a sense of excellence, as Colossians 3 says. I think this is Colossians 3, 23. Do everything as unto the Lord. Do everything as unto the Lord. And actually, Paul is talking to people that were slaves, and that's hard. That wasn't right. God wasn't in agreement with this at all. And yet, he was saying, if this is where you find yourself, still do everything as unto the Lord because you will have your reward from God. And not just when you, people are watching, but do everything as unto the Lord. So I, that's a very powerful verse. I think that's Colossians 3.23. So may we be about the good works that God has already prepared in advance for us to do, right? this Sunday morning. So be blessed 
and sending love and uh, reach out if you'd like. Thank you.